Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce the next session, which is the politicians panel. And this is a truly cross-party panel. And I think it shows the breadth of interest and concern that is about this issue. Sadly, we don't yet have the depth that we need, but we, we hope that events like this will help us to garner further support. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dermot Kehoe, who's going to chair this panel. Dermot has 20, or oh, at least 40 years <laughs> working in public affairs, communications and journalism, specifically in the creative sector, but he's also a fabulous political strategist. So I'll hand over to Dermot. Uh, thank you and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's fantastic to be here. I just want to say, following uh, the last session, um, having got to know uh, Kate and Bev, it would be impossible to underestimate the cost that they have paid personally for what they've been doing. And it just makes me proud that I know them and the work that no one else I, that I know could achieve what they've achieved by bringing us all together. So um, I just want to... <laughs> Secondly, there is a, there is a, I don't know if it's apocryphal, an ancient Chinese proverb, may you be cursed to live in interesting times. <laughs> well, politically, we certainly live uh, uh, in interesting times. And again, going back to what people said on the international panel, we live in very polarized times. We live in an age where political discourse has become ever more um, vicious uh, and ever more distant from each other, yet somehow, there has, on this issue, on the issue of gender identity, there seems often to be a complete consensus across Parliament and across political parties, which, frankly, baffles me. Um, so I'm delighted, then, to uh, welcome you to our political panel, and I'm delighted that we have a range of politicians uh, who are exceptions. At a time when politicians maybe don't always get the best press, the politicians joining us today I believe are courageous and outspoken, and I'm proud to join them to join me today. First of all, I'd like to invite up uh, Sir Peter Bottomley. Uh, Sir Peter was first elected to the House in 1975, and in 2019, he became the father of the House. So I'm um, very delighted to have you with us this evening. Uh, secondly, I'd like to invite up uh, Joanna Cherry. Uh, Joanna clearly needs no introduction, but I'm going to give her one anyway, because that's what I've been asked to do. So, um, Joanna the Giant Slayer, um, often known for her uh, case against uh, Boris Johnson in proroguing uh, Parliament successfully. She is, she is a King's Counsel and the MP for Edinburgh South West and Chair of the UK Parliament Joint Committee on Human Rights. She also, as a Crown Counsel, was one of the first specialist sex crime prosecutors in Scotland's pioneering National Sex Crime Unit. Welcome, Joanna. I'd like, next like to invite up Baroness Ludford. Baroness Ludford is a Liberal Democrat and a member of the House of Lords, but she also served in the European Parliament from 1999 to 2014. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> Next, uh, Dr. Shara Ali, if you can come to the stage. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ali was a national spokesperson for the Green Party of England and Wales for many years and its former deputy leader. He is currently taking the party to court for discrimination on the grounds of gender critical belief, which he has dubbed worthy of respect in a political party. Mm. 
I see what you did there. Um, he's an author of two popular books, but interestingly, interestingly, his PhD tackled the morality of lying and deception in public life. <laughs> so I'm sure that could make uh, uh, another book. And uh, finally, uh, unfortunately, Rosie's been uh, uh, detained, but Alison, you can come up and join us. And Alison is a, a councillor in East Renfrewshire, or Renfrewshire, is that correct? And a Labour councillor in East Renfrewshire and a supporter of LGB Alliance. And you don't have a chair. <laughs> She's not that jumped up. Right, fantastic. So, um, thank you. First of all, um, Sir Peter, I'll, I'll first ask the panel a series of questions, and then I'll throw it open to the audience and to uh, Slido, and I'll hopefully get as much as possible. As we know, we're talking a lot about accountabilities. Uh, politicians are accountable, so I'd like to get as many questions from the floor and on Slido. But first of all, um, Sir Peter, if I may characterise you as being on the rational wing of the Conservative Party. Um, I'd be really interested to know uh, two things, really. One, what brought you to this issue, the issue around sex and gender and the conflicts uh, that that brings? And what do you see as Father of the House as the way forward? How do we get to a better place in terms of public debate? Thank you. I've come into public and political service for justice. So I spent a lot of time trying to get child benefit for the first child. I spent a lot of time trying to get votes for everyone in Southern Africa. I tried to help delay the assassination of Oscar Romero in El Salvador when he was standing up for the rights of the downtrodden. And because Stephen Lawrence lived and died in my first constituency, I spent a lot of time listening to Dr. Richard Stone, who was John Sentamu, was the advisors to the Stephen Lawrence inquiry, Lord McPherson. And I heard Richard Stone speaking at a meeting on housing at the British Library, where one of his observations was that the people who have the most power are white, middle-class males in full-time jobs. So it's my job to find, to learn, to listen, and to try to help. On this, when the legislation for equal civil marriage was going through Parliament, it came back to the House of Commons from the House of Lords for a very short debate, and they thought they'd finished it, but there was a minute and a half left. And I stood up and I said, I now know that three people who taught me were same-sex inclined. The one I knew about, the headmaster, got married age 64 to a woman and lived happily with her for 16 years. One I didn't, who taught me physics, got murdered by a rent boy, and the person who was my moral tutor, not those he did much or I learnt much, at university, spent the last 31 years of his life miserable and celibate in a monastery. All of those seem to me to be a terrible waste of life. And I stand with those who want people to be able to grow up, to be what they want to be, and let them be. It seems to be very simple. On the particular thing of the LGB alliance, I became concerned when I started wondering why it was that Professor Kathleen Stock was being abused. And I started looking into the students at Sussex and discovered a person called Liam Hackett, who runs or has run an organization called Ditch the Label, an anti-bullying charity, was bullying Kathleen Stock and described her as a dangerous extremist. It seems to me that his trustees should have had him out the moment that was known. I will... And the last thing, which I hope you don't take as disrespectful, is because I'm not lesbian, and I'm not Labour, and I'm not a woman, I can say these things and no one bothers to report it. <laughs> well, next, Joanna, you are a lesbian. <laughs> I've not outed you, um, but you're not, <laughs> you're not Labour. But um, are we just talking to ourselves? Bev referred to, you know... The, the, the cult is being in a bubble. Do the electorate care? Is this going to move votes on this issue? Um, I don't think we are talking to ourselves any longer. We might have been at the beginning 
of organisations such as LGB Alliance, but we're certainly not now. And I can see concrete evidence of that in Scotland. I think either Kate or Bev referred earlier to the fact that there was polling published in the Sunday Times last week in Scotland, which shows that public opinion on self-identification has, has really moved in Scotland. Now, I actually think I'm very proud of the LGBT rights protections we have in Scotland. Uh, I think we truly have equal rights for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and for trans people. And I think lots of people across the United Kingdom support equality and support trans rights, but they don't support the erasure of sex as a meaningful concept, and, uh, and uh, they don't support self-identification because self-identification is not confined to trans people. It basically means that any man uh, can self-identify as a woman after living as a woman, not defined uh, for three months, down, you know, from age of 16 upwards with no real meaningful gatekeeping at all. And you don't have to have had the sort of experience I had as a sex crimes prosecutor to know that that potentially poses a risk to women and girls and indeed to, to male children if anyone can self-identify without any barrier to that. And so I think what's happened certainly in Scotland is because organisations like LGB Alliance and For Women Scot have been talking about these issues and campaigning around these issues, the no debate mantra has failed. And there is a bit of a debate now. There's more discussion of this in the newspapers. Uh, politicians like myself who stuck our, I stuck my head above the parapet. I think people thought they would succeed in cancelling me. They haven't. I'm still here and I intend to c continue in politics. And so I think, uh, I don't think we are talking to ourselves any longer. I think that there's evidence such as that Sunday Times poll that the conversation we started and the courage of people like Kate and Bev in starting this organisation and keeping going despite the demonisation has meant that there's now a meaningful debate and it's cutting through to voters. And, you know, that's what matters to politicians. I cannot tell you how important it is to write to and email your members of parliament, members of the Westminster parliament like me, members of the Scottish parliament, the Welsh Senate, write to them because we do pay attention to emails and the more we get, the more important it is. Now, I see in my mailbag, I get a huge amount of mail about the issues we're discussing today and it's overwhelmingly favorable to my position. I can't walk up a street in Edinburgh without someone stopping me and thanking me for sticking up for women's rights and LGB rights. So often people say to me, I work in the public sector. I am scared to speak out because I would lose my job. And so I think Bev was right when she said politicians are supposed to show leadership. You shouldn't be in politics if we are afraid to stand up for what we believe is right. And, you know, politics should be... Politics should be about debate. We only make good policy if we have open debate. You take my party, for example. The Scottish National Party was founded by intellectuals and artists and thinkers in the 1930s. And so that, that the debate, that the mantra of no debate should take hold in my party, I find so offensive to the founding principles of my party and indeed the tradition of my country. You know, Kate has often spoken about how Scotland is the home of the Enlightenment. You know, we should be able to debate issues uh, without fear and we should be able to have free speech with, without consequences. Um, so yes, I don't think we're just talking to ourselves. I think there has been incredible breakthrough, particularly in the last year. Thank you. Thank you. I'd, Baroness Ludford, if I could come to you next and also perhaps expand on this theme of um, <clears throat> no debate. I mean, you come from a party with liberal in the name and a proud tradition of there's the welfare state and extending democracy. And I find of all the many baffling parts of this, it's part of this no debate mantra, having someone um, 
again, when they talk about um, our history, having been there back in the 80s and 90s with Clause 28, and we brought on those advances in gay rights, we didn't stop debating. We couldn't wait to meet people, you know, introduce me to the next bishop or someone else or, or uh, you know, the football club, we'll go meet them. We debated and debated and debated and that's how we won. So, um, Baroness Ludford, in, particularly within the Liberal Democratic Party and from your experience, what's been your experience around no debate and how do we get past that? Well, thanks very much, uh, Dermot, and it's a pleasure to be on this cross-party panel. Um, I have the honour to sit on the Joint Human Rights Committee, which Joanna so competently chairs. And um, I... Um, I mean, uh, European things are my, are my day job. Um, and, you know, uh, my last six years have been largely dominated by Brexit, hating every moment of it, obviously. Uh, and, um, and also, um, my husband died three years ago, so, so the last few years have been a, a little bit um, difficult. Um, so I kind of stumbled into this maelstrom of aggression and hostility and intolerance. Somewhat by, by accident, um, I put my head above the parapet about four years ago. Uh, goodness knows, I mean, I was so naive. And, and it had passed me by because, as I say, I was so fixated on Brexit and then, and then, and then, and then with bereavement. Um, and um, I was so naive that when I got called a turf, I said, what's a turf? <laughs> and um, that was only in 2018. So I started to get abused on Twitter. Um, I, I must admit, um, I, I, went, I went home to my husband, who was still alive at the time, and I... And, I kind of burst into tears because I, I was upset about it. And this was within the party. And um, I thought we, we were a liberal party which believed in free debate. I mean, I always quote colleagues the preamble to our constitution of which um, liberal Democrats are inordinately proud. And one of the phrases is our commitment to a fair, free and open society in which no one should be enslaved by poverty, ignorance or conformity. Yeah, every Lib Dem scratch them and they can quote that. Um, so why were we not having an open and tolerant and respectful debate? Anyway, um, <laughs> I, I went. I, mean, I was so upset because in all my uh, now over 40 years in the party, I'd never met a subject where we weren't able to have a free debate and disagree, um, disagree well, as people say. Anyway, my husband didn't have a clue what I was talking about. Um, and it ended up, because he always wanted to fix things for me, and ended up I was having a row. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, and so I didn't kind of re-emerge until about a year ago on the subject when I co-signed an amendment to the police bill on um, collecting statistics in the criminal justice system by sex, because there's a whole disparity of practices, and I was rather um, um, influenced by Professor Alice Sullivan, who's a professor of statistics at UCL. Um, and you get no comparability of statistics and all kinds of things. And it just seemed to me an issue about integrity of statistics. I mean, obviously, there's sensitive issues involved, which would have to be properly handled. But anyway, um, so I got abuse about that and a shed load of complaints, and there have been three waves of complaints against me to the powers that be in the party, including a demand that the whip be removed from me in the House of Lords. Um, I mean, clearly, because I'm not, um, shamefully, I, I am unelected in, in the Lords, um, I can't be deselected. Uh, so, so, in a sense, I've got le less to lose, which made me conscious even more of my responsibility to be true to what I believe the values and principles of my, of my uh, party um, are. Um, anyway, I, so, you know, whenever I retweet J.K. Rowling or Maya Forstadt or Alison Bailey or let alone Joanna Cherry, obviously, um, um, Kathleen Stock, Julie Bindle, um, uh, you know, I get another bit of harassment on, on Twitter. And as far as I know, I have never, ever said anything hateful or transphobic. And, and I hope, and I don't associate with people who are hateful or transphobic. And, and that brought me to the LGBT Alliance 
um, and I believe that they stand for something important and, um, uh, and I'm delighted to see what a wonderful turnout at, at the splendid conference uh, today. So um, can I just name check the um, Liberal Voice for Women and uh, the LGB uh, Forum in the Lib Dems who have a joint stall out there. We've got a little corner for all the politicos and um, they kind of work together as well because we do have a movement in, in the Liberal Democrats and I believe that um, you know, we will eventually kind of win through to have this uh, proper debate in the party. Some of you will have seen that has been an opinion from a, 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 a leading equalities KC, um, which has been put in the public domain by Liberal Voice for Women in a blog. And um, there's another one in the pipeline to the party, which I believe will open up the discussion about this in the party. Thank you. Dr. Ali, um, welcome. Uh, I did read recently that the um, Green Party in Scotland had um, uh, disassociated itself. Is it excommunicated? I'm not sure the language of the Green Party in England and Wales. And if Twitter is to be believed, which of course it shouldn't, uh, it's all your fault. Um, <laughs> so, so, so what's with that? Thanks for your, thanks for your um, completely unprovocative question, Dermot. And before I come to that, <laughs> Before I come to that, I just wanted to reflect, firstly, on, on, the, on the last uh, 12 months. So, a year ago, um, to my shame, I was one of those delegates to this conference who took up the option of a lanyard that you wouldn't be photographed in. And this year, I'm proud to say that I accepted the honour of an invitation to your conference. So, thank you for that. And much has changed over the last 12 months. The political climate is changing uh, in all the right ways. Forstetter, I just need to mention the names. Forstetter, Bailey, Tavistock, and don't forget Bindle, Julie Bindle. That was a terrific, didn't even have to go to court. That's how strong the case was. So there has been movement, there has been change. In that 12 months, yes, I've had, I've been forced this isn't a path that I've chosen, but it's a path which has chosen me. I've felt compelled to stand tall against my party, who has attempted to excommunicate me for discrimination. And it wasn't even possible to phrase it this way at the time, and that's how much things have changed, thanks to Maya, for discrimination on grounds of protected gender-critical belief. And I intend to win that, not just for, for, for my sake, and all those in my party who are facing this hostile environment, but for all political parties, because this is imperative. In terms of the, the Scottish, Scottish Green Party, well, we have a history of um, ties with Scottish Green Party. Strong, for all the right reasons, but I don't think somehow that members of our party are going to be subdued into changing our policies or to caving in to what is essentially an authoritarian demand. Because there are false... This is the Orwellian Kafkaesque world, that political world that we're in now. Instead of disciplining members of my or any political party, for fake, monstrous allegations of transphobia, which are unfounded. We should be protecting those individuals under human rights legislation. We should be taking action against those who are alleging falsely through transphobia smear campaigns. They should be the target, and we are not going to be emotionally blackmailed by the Scottish Green Party um, on, on those terms. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali. And um, I'm delighted, uh, Rosie Heston, do you want to join us on the platform? Go on. Who wants, who wants Rosie? <laughs> yes, 
so again, while uh, Rona earns her, earns her stipend, um, uh, Rosie Duffield, again, needs no uh, introduction to us. Uh, she's the Labour MP for uh, Canterbury uh, since uh, 2015. Um, and we're well known to all of you. So we now have, um, there's be two Labour people on the platform, which is no bias on my part <laughs> at all, I hasten to add. It was just merely circumstance. So if we could ask both Alison and, and Rosie. Uh, well, first of all, I wanted to ask Rosie what it's like becoming a gay icon, but that might just be... <laughs> just be, just be. I'll leave those sorts of questions to Graham Norton. We'll do the um, serious political stuff here. But I'd like to know, um, um, both personally and for the audience around the Labour Party, I mean, it, it is possible, likely, the Labour Party will form a government any, any day um, uh, soon. Um, and regardless of everything else, in terms of the, the issues that we've been talking around here about the conflicts uh, and rights and how we navigate that between sex and gender, I, I, within the Labour Party, I think there's a broad uh, support for the sort of views we've heard outlined here about respectful debate and, and so on, but it doesn't seem to get voiced. And as we know, the, the Keir Starmer was at um, the um, <coughs> News um, <laughs> Awards the other day. So, so um, Alison and Rosie, w what's happening in the Labour Party? How can that move on? How do you think we can bring, allow people in the Labour Party to express their views? It's a million dollar question. Thank you so much for putting up with me being so late. I'm sorry. It's been a bit of a week in Parliament. <laughs> Um, and everything's just kind of going a bit crazy. So many emails about what's happening, and, you know, we don't have any answers, do we? We don't know what's going on. Um, I also haven't been able to speak for most of the week, but that's, that seems to be better now. In terms of the Labour Party, I mean, Alison will know more on a sort of local level, really, and I think that's, that's the key thing, because these movements come from the ground up, don't they, and they're, they're membership-led. But in terms of the PRP, I mean, you know, it's, it's a bit of an open secret that I'm persona non grata, really. Um, you know, me and Tonya Antonia, and a few others have sort of popped our head above the parapet. And we, we reckon on there being 30 or 40 broadly supportive Labour MPs, perhaps more of them. But, you know, what we're beginning to see is that the tide is turning and the public are sort of demanding that actually... And action groups are forming and saying, you know, this is a load of old rubbish. And I think when that happens we're going to see Labour MPs going, oh, but of course, I was always on your side. I always agree with you. <laughs> Similarly with the SNP. You know, and I think that then it, that's going to be quite hard for Joe and I because we're going to be like, really? You know, we were out in the wilderness. Um, I mean, it's quite... I never blow my own trumpet because I'm just not that kind of person. But when you've won a seat that's never been held by the Labour Party and you're the only woman that's ever won a seat for the party in your county of two million people, and in the 2019 election when you lost 60 colleagues and you were the only one, I think, whose majority went up 10 times, it's quite hard to see why my opinions on anything, let alone winning in my county, are completely not even asked. I get... I don't get talked to, I don't get asked around the table. It was the same when I was chair of Women's PLP. Um, we even had uh, a situation this week which was horrific for my constituency, 45 preventable baby deaths. It's been, a, it's been an event that has taken two years of my office you know, being involved with the inquiry. And the front bench, or whoever writes the lines, we had a, a statement yesterday, and lovely Ferial Clark is our shadow minister, but nobody from the party even reached out to me to ask me, you know, how's it been? What would you like our top lines to be? They didn't think that the only MP in Kent. And I can only conclude that it is because of this. You know, in 2017, I was all over the sort of the posters and these, these things at conference, and We Won Canterbury was the kind of chant of that, of that year, and yet... I've never had a visit from a leader in Kent, and do they not want any more seats in Kent? Am I just so toxic? I don't know. So these are the kind of spaces where I feel safe, and I've got friends, and it's a cross-party thing, but we're just ordinary people who don't want to call a biological man, she or her, because we can see that they're not, you know? <laughs> I just 
is something that could use. And as for pink news, I, I use pink news, but you all know what we, we usually call them. It's, it's one thing to want to go to an event celebrating, you know, diversity and LGBT rights and, and awards and all of that. That's great, okay? But maybe not if it's the only clickbait site that has trolled me and my colleagues to within an inch of our lives, including during covid on New Year's Eve, sometimes five times a day, my staff will get emails from the editorial team at Prick News, and they're asking for some comment on a tweet I did. It's relentless harassment, actually, now. And my leader's there. Not only does he not speak to me, he goes to those things where I'm trolled. And that is a bit galling, I have to be honest. I'm slightly... <laughs> But anyway, enough, enough ranting. I'll be quiet now. <laughs> Sorry. No, thank, thank you, Rosie, and you're always welcome here. Um, so the Labour Party doesn't need to win in Kent. It also needs to win uh, in Scotland. Arsenal's from the west of Scotland, a very beautiful part of the world. So up there, is the Labour Party in Scotland different? Are there any green shoots of recovery? Everything's different up there. <laughs> um, First of all, I just want to thank Rosie before we go any further. Um, and I, I, it's important, I, I am a councillor, I, I'm a councillor in lo local government. And I think it's important for Rosie to know that she has a huge amount of support within the Labour Party in terms of membership, um, ordinary Labour uh, voters, and um, you are not alone. And I'm not trying to minimise the impact of what you have experienced because it's been completely unacceptable. But I just want to hold that hand of friendship out to you to know that there's millions of people standing behind me. I'm very grateful that I have accidentally been allowed a, a little bit of a platform today because um, I, I was placeholding for, for, for Rosie earlier. I just would like to bring in the perspective of local government um, and add to some of the pre previous comments. For, for, for us to be effective in diluting the impact of gender uh, identity ideology, I can't stress strongly enough to you that to start to exert pressure on your local representatives is critical. And I'm going to give you a few reasons why. Um, if, we, if we think of it as, as kind of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the, the local government is, is the seedbed, if you like, for often for all of the political parties, political talent that moves into, whether it's Holyrood, whether it's the Bell Senate, whether it's, it's Westminster. Quite often that's where that seedbed is nurtured. The selections take place, quite often driven by the activists who are very active in local government. We have to, we have to uh, push at the, the, the open door, because I think it is open, to allow ordinary activists on the grounds the courage and the space to do what we are doing up here. They need to be able to speak about their concerns because they are concerned. And I know because I'm often told that, but when you take that step to make it a, a public conversation, then they step back because they know what could be at risk for them reputationally, their friends, their family, um, etc. So to allow um, that space to be nurtured, we need to get it at the, 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 right at the grassroots. I would also remind, um, not that I'm not trying to patronise you, I'm just trying to kind of put a bit of a spotlight on this, but just to remind you that an awful lot of the policy that originates um, and then is, is delivered, often in a non-statutory way, is done through your local councils. It's done in the shadows in terms of the, the no debate issues. Quite often, these policies are given over, over to the, the officers of councils and there's very little discussion that can take place amongst elected members. That's the fighting ground that I would love to see more people coming onto because 
if it's education we're looking at, you're talking about how gender identity is taught in schools, how sex education is delivered in schools, how safeguarding is utterly undermined. And if you, if you attended the previous workshop, you'll have heard some examples of that. I personally come from uh, Renfrewshire. That's where Flo Job delivered the Drag Queen Story Hour to primary children. He presented his Flo and his social media that all the kids immediately went to there was flow job and I can tell you that was like a small atomic bomb it was detonated in Renfrewshire. The parents went absolutely nuts. Mary Black, who was the MP, who uh, facilitated that visit, she's not even the, that constituency MP, it was part of her prophetising for this, this uh, issue, um, went to grounds and everyone else who was involved, including the individual who at the time was called flow job, were damaged. She was able to just come back to her, her, her bubble in Westminster, protected. All of those other individuals uh, suffered, and teaching staff suffered significant damage. Thank so I'm going to wind up, but I just want to say to you that if you start putting pressure, as well as the, 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 the legislative uh, areas, on your local councillors, it's a lot harder for this stuff to be delivered on the ground. That's where we can build a dam while these fights are being fought in the courts and in our legislative bodies. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Alison. All, all politics is local, after all. Uh, so I remind people to put um, questions on Slido as well. If I can pick one, which I think is quite um, uh, challenging but relevant. It says, several panellists have spoken about uh, not being transphobic and being pro-trans. Can you elaborate on what this means? Is it gender identity but not changing sex? I don't know if Sarah or Joanna, you mentioned that. Joanna? I think the point I was trying to make is that uh, I believe in, in equal rights. Not special rights for people, but, but equal rights. And um, I, you know, I'm very happy with the Equality Act, which was passed by a Labour government, and with the protected characteristics that are set out in the Equality Act, which includes sex, includes sexual orientation, particularly important to those of us who are same-sex attracted, include gender reassignment, not gender identity, gender reassignment, and then include also religion and belief, which has proved so important in Maya's case and uh, Alison's case. So the point I'm seeking to make is this. Um, I think an, an earlier speaker said that they don't talk about this debate we're all engaged in as the trans rights debate, because I don't believe that equal rights for trans people uh, are wrong. Of course they're right, because I, I believe in equality and I believe in human rights. What I'm concerned about is aggressive gender identity I ideology, which seeks to change uh, the protected characteristics in the Equality Act, which in a sense uh, seeks to create a hierarchy of protected characteristics, the absolute opposite um, to what the Equality Act, to what equality should be about, and also about this stealthy rewriting of, of the law which uh, has, uh, has, has gone on. Um, so that's the point I, I'm seeking to make. I think it, it's very important for whoever asked that question, members of the audience, to understand that uh, as a politician, uh, and uh, who represents, I hope, all her constituents, I will have trans constituents, it's very important for me to know that my trans constituents and indeed my trans friends know that I'm not transphobic and that I believe in equal rights for trans people. What I'm concerned about is those who wish to create a hierarchy of rights, at which I think we're finding ourselves at the bottom as LGB people, and those who seek to, to rewrite the law by, by stealth, and those who seek to prevent uh, legislators like myself actually talking about the law. I mean, I mean how can that possibly be right. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, two more questions. One I'll put to Sir Peter and one to, to Rosie. To Sir Peter, it's been asked, how did we get here? How did almost 600 highly educated people, 
I presume they're referring to members of parliament, uh, who loves debate and think critically, came to believe that someone can literally change sex. And then, Rosie, a question for you. Um, again, I'm, I'm afraid it's about um, Keir, but he, um, what are your thoughts on Keir Starmer making misgendering a hate crime? And does he also want to make misogyny a hate crime? So your thoughts on that? On the Kavita, yeah. first one, I don't think over 600 people who are highly educated are necessarily our colleagues in the House of Commons. I'm not sure I'd be counting the minority either. I think that uh, we didn't do what I think may be suggested as far as I'm aware. The issue, I think, comes to what I call the Stonewall Marketing League, where in a period of a few years, a lot of people signed up for what might have seemed good, but then had become absolute perfectionists, which led to the... I don't sort of use, use language that goes further than it ought to. Brutality, I think, is to ordinary people with ordinary views who just wanted to recognize that if, for example, you need to separate men and women, it's done XX and open if you want. It's not done choose to be XX if you're XY. That applies to sport, prison, and hospital. So the question was about misgendering being a crime. I mean, is that a serious thing? I, I don't know. Is that coming to Parliament anytime soon? I hope not, because you might as well arrest me now. I'm not calling Eddie Izzard a woman. Um, that's, our, that's our headline, I'm, Rosie, I'm, happy, I'm afraid. Well, I'm happy, I'm happy to, to stand by that and be arrested, but I think the more important and, and sort of really really key thing is that if you're a little girl and you see somebody that you absolutely believe is male in your space, or if you are a Muslim woman and you feel totally unsafe and you see somebody who looks like a man, your instincts tell you that as a man they've got big hands and male characteristics, and you tell someone, are you then going to be arrested for calling them what they are? We're not talking about trans hate. We're not talking about people who've transitioned. We're talking about self-ID people deciding they can go into bathrooms. And if you're someone like me who has been stalked at Labour Party conference by your abusive ex-partner and who, in fact, Stella Creasy took into the ladies' toilets to a escape, what do I do then if he decides that he's coming in after me because he'd followed me around Brighton? And I don't know. What are the answers to those questions? Perhaps if Keir's interested in pursuing this further, we can have a proper debate about it. But like Joe said, we're stopped from discussing these things. Nobody I know is anti-trans because human rights are for everybody. But like she said, their rights do not trump women's rights to call out the truth. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to say something about hate crime legislation, and I think this has come to the fore, I think, because Keir said in his speech to You Know What News that, uh, that he was going to introduce hate crime legislation, and it was reported that misgendering would be made a crime. Now, what I would say in response to that is, here is a really important reason why we need uh, parliamentarians who have the courage to, uh, to, uh, to, to stand up for sex-based rights and to stand up for LGB rights and to stand up for human rights. We've still got a Human Rights Act in the United Kingdom at the moment, and that means that all legislation passed by the Westminster Parliament must be compatible with human rights, and in particular with the European Convention of Human Rights. Article 9 of the Convention it protects your right to your beliefs. Article 10 protects your right to freedom of speech. I do not believe that legislation that would make misgendering a hate crime would survive a human rights challenge under Article 9 and Article 10. Myself, I tend to, partly because I'm a politician and I have to try and behave myself, I tend to use the pronouns that people want me to use even though it's not a practice that I follow, putting my pronouns on my emails. But I tend to, I tend to do that. But I don't, think, I don't believe in compelled speech. And uh, I, I, don't, I can't understand 
why the Labour Party that has been so good in the fight to defend the Human Rights Act uh, would think, and someone like Keir, who's a lawyer, would so blithely talk about legislation that uh, ba basically breaches fundamental aspects of the Convention on Human Rights. We've had some hate crime legislation north of the border that's caused concern. It's not yet been brought into force. I'm on the record as saying that when this new hate crime legislation in Scotland is brought into force, I do not believe that aspects of it will survive a human rights a challenge. So human rights and equality law are our friends. Thank you. Um, Joanna against, against Keir across the dispatch box. I'd like to see that, but I, I can't see how that could happen. Um, Sarah yeah, and then I Shara. Just, I just really wanted to add that, yeah, uh, I, I agree with that last, very much what I agree with everything Joanna said, but um, I, I want my party to support not only the Human Rights Act on which we are vocal, and the Human Rights Act includes, as Joanna has just uh, said, uh, freedom of belief, thought, conscience, and freedom of expression, but also the Equality Act. And um, I'm sad to say that my party didn't even, and actually the Labour Party did in its 2019 manifesto, didn't even say we uphold the Equality Act in all its protected characteristics, which of course include sex, sexual orientation, and, as well as gender reassignment. Um, so that's point one. Secondly, I think, I felt compelled because I think earlier people talked about the progressive debate, you know, that it should be seen as progressive to be intolerant. Um, it hurts me that, that some of the coverage now, more of the debate, is in papers like the Daily Telegraph and the Daily Mail, a bit in the Sunday Times, but it's not in the Guardian. Um, and, um, you know, that, that hurts a bit, and the Tory party is saying more on this than a Liberal Party. And I'm, I'm cross about that, and I won't shut up until my party also talks about this. Thank you. And we're coming to the end, and Shara. Yeah, um, so just, just to pick up on, on, on a couple of, of the questions. What has led us to this point? I think one of the ingredients has been no debate, of course, and so that's been institutionalized. Another ingredient has been identity politics, virtue signaling. I mean, these ingredients have been extremely damaging, and I would never say that no debate is over, but its time is coming to an end, and we've been instrumental in that. Because if you want, I mean, I'm a philosopher by training as well, so I also like to have a robust sense of reality. And the reason for no debate is because the ideological artifice will simply crumble under the weight of rationality. And that's what we've been seeing, and that is our main antidote. The same in courts of law. When we hear witnesses try and defend their vexatious allegations, they can't. And we can see it all before our eyes. So debate, ultimately, is going to be what rescues us from this. I mean, I was uh, so deeply offended and mortified when, uh, at a conference, party conference in 2018, we were calling, the co-leader at the time was calling uh, the police upon a group of women who were just distributing leaflets. I mean, this is obscene. Now, just on Keir Starmer, finally, um, he always looks like he's in rabbit in the headlights mode, right? He'll literally run away. There was a time when he was running away from journalists at a conference, right? When normally the politicians want to speak to journalists. If you ask him what is a woman, they can't answer that with a straight answer. He still refuses to do that. And in terms of the um, obscene suggestion, actually, uh, which is, sh should scare everybody, the idea that you would criminalize somebody, it, can you imagine a situation where we have a rape victim of all people, the obscenity, the moral obscenity, of criminalizing a rape victim for refusing to use the preferred pronouns of the rapist. How obscene and morally objectionable is that? So, Keir, I'm afraid, Keir Starmer hasn't thought through his virtue signaling identity politics stance, and it will not survive it. Thank you, Sharon. Sure. Well, unfortunately, rather like Liz Truss's premiership, we are coming uh, to an end. But I have been handed uh, one last question from a, this Hodgkiss for Joanna, which is, ask about the metal chicken. 
Thank you, Rona. Rona's question was ask about the metal chicken. Last year at the conference, Rona entertained us with how she keeps chickens. And she in particular was talking about how she had two scraggedy old rescue chickens, which she'd named Kate and Bev. <laughs> and so when I went to visit Rona and her partner in the summertime, I asked if I could see these scraggedy old rescue chickens. And um, I didn't actually let on at that time. I'm actually, actually scared of birds. Obviously, not birds, but feathered birds. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> anyway, so I went up Rona's garden to see the chickens. And uh, I had my dark glasses on at the time because it had been a lovely day. It was just starting to get dark. And she said to me, oh, dear, I think one of the chickens has escaped. So... I scuttled off down the garden back to the house as quickly as I could, but I had to take my glasses off, and I'm very blind without my prescription glasses. And just as I was getting near to the house, I saw what I thought was the rescued chicken on the ground and very unbutchly went, ah! <laughs> So it, it turned out later it was a small metal chicken ornament <laughs> that I had reacted to so badly. And this is, I don't know how many people Rona has told this story, but now I've told the whole conference, and you can see that... Uh, I'm actually uh, butch on the streets, but <laughs> firm in the sheets. I'll throw it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, fantastic, and, and, and thank you. And I'd like to thank the whole panel. As people said, I'm just so delighted it's a cross-party panel. And I'm not sure we could have done this uh, 12 months ago, certainly not 18 months ago. But it's also, also a serious business, as, as we know. And uh, as I said before, at a time when politicians are often held in, in low esteem, and I think when we see what's um, going on, that should make us, and I hope people in this room, more engaged in politics, not less. It's never been more important to get involved, to join a party even, um, to, to write to your MP, to write to your councillor, to stand for council. I mean, do it. It's done by people. So it is politics, I genuinely believe this, is a noble pursuit. And I think it's one of the noblest, noblest pursuits that anyone can do. It is a public service. And I think we need to restore it to that level of standing. And I think the people in this room could help to do that. So thank you. Thank you.